Okay, we're gonna talk about cell phones, kids, when to get cell phones for your kids, uh, how to apply some rules. Uh, this is one parent speaking to another, uh, father of a 10, 12, and 14 year old currently. Talk about some of the things that we've done. Can't say that we have been perfect by any means, but uh, hopefully some of this stuff is helpful. I don't think that any of this is going to apply directly, but my hope and my purpose for doing this is that maybe some of the ideas and some of the things that we've thought of or thought through might be things that you can add to your consideration. I also think that some of the high level, the three high level points that I'm gonna talk about are ideas that I've talked specifically and, and in multiple times with my kids because I think that there's a bigger picture that we need to consider beyond just you know making sure they're following certain rules for the use of their cell phones or whatever. So, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, walking through this and listening to it will be helpful for you as you uh, try to develop some guidelines. I'll also say that. Uh, well, let's first of all let's talk, start by talking about ages. Uh, our we have a, a son. We have two sons and a daughter. Uh, daughters in the middle. Uh, so they're 10, 12, and 14. Um, our first phone for the kids, any of them did not have um, internet access or did not have cell phone coverage. So it wasn't actually a cell phone. It was just a, basically an internet tool. Uh, what we did was we started probably when our oldest was about 8 or 10 with a phone. It was an extra iPhone that I believe it did actually have a phone number, but it wasn't assigned to anybody. We called it our house phone. And they could use it for looking up things or calling us if they need to get a hold of us or different things like that, but it wasn't assigned to anyone. Uh, we also got, when our son turned 14, he got a cell phone. Uh, I know that the ages are different for some people. We've talked to a lot of people who got phones uh, for kids when they're younger, and there's all kinds of other considerations, I think. One of the big things, or the biggest thing to consider for us was, you know, convenience for us as parents, uh, running the family and things like that, but also the, the maturity level of the kid, where they're at, and what they can handle. So we'll talk about those specific circumstances with our family. And then child-specific rules that may or may not be the same, uh, which is just fine. I think it's appropriate because kids mature at different ages and then some gender differences uh, for concerns there. So as I mentioned, our oldest uh, was 14 when he got his first phone, so we're, that was uh, seven or eight months ago. And uh, we had a, our home phone for several years before that, which uh, the kids did carry at times when we needed them to, but it was for a specific thing and then they were back and it was it was put back where it was supposed to be and it wasn't their phone. There was no texting uh, to friends or anything like that. It was purely for inner family communications and things like that. So at 14, our oldest got his own phone uh, and uh, that came with some rules and guidelines, which I'll go through in a minute. And then uh, about the same time, our daughter, who is two years younger, is 12 now, also got a phone. And uh, I don't remember the exact circumstances around why we did that but uh, at, at that time, but the point was is that we felt like she was mature enough and ready and also less risk at 12 versus uh, our, our son at, at 14. So uh, our belief is that the boys are more likely to explore sexual related, related content on the internet than girls are. Uh, they're also more likely to get into uh, different apps and different things and, and stuff they probably shouldn't at a younger age. And so uh, we feel and we feel like our, our concerns have been validated that we need to be a little, you know, be a little more careful with our, our sons than, than our daughter. Not to say that we, have, we don't have the same rules or anything like that, but there are a little bit of differences and obviously we implemented it. Uh, when she was at a younger age because we felt like she could handle it. And for the most part, she has. Uh, she has had much less discipline in terms of her use of phone 
Uh, she, I don't think that she has lost her phone, maybe but once or twice for a few days at a time or something where our 14 year old had uh, quite a bit more struggle with that and did have some times where he lost it. And, and, uh, and you know, in, in his feedback on that, he actually felt like it was good for him. It was freedom. Uh, it's amazing how we get tied to these devices and just they, they literally run us, uh, kind of like our email, you know, if we, we feel like we have to keep up on our email, you know, every single day and, and it just sort of drives us. So, okay, uh, so there are, you know, a lot of differences. There's gender differences. There's, there's uh, rules per child differences, different things like that. Our, our youngest son, who's 10, uh, definitely is not ready for a phone and probably won't be for uh, until he's at least 14 unless the world radically changes or something. He's just clearly not there um, in terms of maturity and things like that. So there may be an opportunity where he has the use of a phone for a certain event if he's doing something or different things like that, but we would not assign him his own uh, for, that, for that reason. So <clears throat> there's three points that I go through in pretty good detail with my kids uh, that I think are incredibly important. The first one I call reputation management. This is not something that I had to deal with when I was a kid in the same way that our kids have to deal with it today, nor so is it really any different for us as parents and as people operating in this world than it is for our kids right now. It's the very same thing. It's just we're more mature. We've been around longer. We kind of have a little more experience with dealing with this different, you know, this kind of stuff. But the bottom line is, is that we're on video a lot of our lives. There's a lot of things that we're doing that other people are watching, potentially videoing, at least photographing, uh, driving down the road. There's there's uh, traffic cameras in a lot of retail environments. There's security cameras in people's homes. There's either security cameras or private phones. At sporting events, there's security cameras as well as private phones. I mean, it's just very uncommon that we're not on video anymore, and people need to realize that. Now, I'm not saying morally or ethically, oh, well, we need to be good people because people are watching. That's not the point. The point is, is that in this regard, is that our kids are developing their reputation based on who's watching. And that does happen through all these different videos. You can get in a lot of trouble if you make a mistake or do something. Obviously, they've got hard evidence of different things. So you got to watch for that. But their friends, our family, different relationships, people in the community, everybody is watching. And the, the kids are building their reputation that's gonna carry into their future. And my fear would be that they, they build a reputation that really isn't them, that's maybe their immaturity speaking, but yet they somehow get stuck in that cycle and then they, they feel like they need to continue playing that out as they get older or or maybe they do make a mistake or something and they're not thinking and they, you know, and that, that sort of ends up being carried with them. And so reputation management is very important and that includes not just video, but what they're saying on text and what kind of photos they're sharing or, or posting or different things like that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's just a consideration, the way they're talking uh, to other people and, and, you know, things like that. So there's things, as you know, there's things that you'll say over text or email or something like that that maybe you wouldn't say in person. And so, you know, an adult is going to approach that a little bit different most than kids. And so we need to provide some guidance and stuff for them. And so the kids, I spend a lot of time with them talking about reputation management, making sure they realize that, hey, they own that, they need to think about it, and it's it's definitely a consideration. So the next one is is I encourage our kids to build real relationships not digital relationships. And so if they don't have a relationship with someone in person, then I don't think that they should have one with them digitally. And so what I try to encourage my kids to do is to use their devices to, to enhance their real relationships instead of trying to build relationships digitally because I just don't think it's a, it's a, it's not something they need. I'm not, I'm not saying it isn't possible or whatever, but it's certainly not something that the kids need. Uh, if they have a cousin or a family member or friend or something that's out of town or something, well, of course, but again, they know them. They have a relationship with them. Uh, if maybe it's a family member that they haven't met, they can at least FaceTime with them. They, you know, they have that ability to, um, to connect with them. So, uh, hang on, my uh, guy here went to sleep, so let me get that back up. So, 
The other, uh, another point that I use is I encourage the kids to put away the who likes who conversations. And maybe it's just because my kids are at the age they are, but they just get into way too many conversations that are all about like who likes who and what boy likes what girl and this girl likes that and whatever. And it's just like, it's just a waste of time. And so I try to encourage my kids to sort of get past that and realize they're, they don't really have to worry about that whole who likes who conversation for many years. They shouldn't be worried about it. They should just be having fun and, and um, not stressing out about all that stuff. So reputation management, uh, uh, building real relationships, and then managing and avoiding the who likes who conversations. The who likes who conversations also ties into reputation management, uh, as does you know building real relationships. So they sort of all come together. So that's my introduction to our list of rules. I'll post those and I'll also post the list of rules that we use in the notes below this video just so everyone has it. I may also make updates to that because the, our list of phone rules has changed a bit since we first started just based on experiences that we've had. And so I'll run through these, I'll explain them, I'll have a little bit of commentary for some of them, but um, then I'll post, I'll post them below and if they're useful, fine. If you like them, fine, take them. If you don't, if you like, you know, 90% of them use them and you think that one's terrible, then just ignore it. Uh, first rule, number one, is trust your parents. Your parents know best and uh, we have your best in mind and so we ask our kids to trust us with that and they do. Uh, rule number two is no phone in the bedrooms. Uh, we do give an exception to this for our daughter. Uh, with our boys, we don't allow phones or computers in their bedrooms. Uh, we just feel like there's too much risk of them spending time watching sports, pornography, or God only knows what. Uh, our daughter does spend a little bit more time on Pinterest than I would like, but we're, we talk to her about that. Uh, but in general, we feel like that hasn't been a problem with her having her phone in a room or a computer in a room for homework uh, thus far. Uh, no phones in the bathrooms. Uh, it's just not a, not a necessary place for it, and, and it tends to, seems like it prolongs the bathroom visits if they are able to sit in there watching videos or texting or who knows what. Uh, access codes on the phones have to be uh, documented and known by the parents so we can look at the phones, grab them from them anytime we want and surf through them and see what's going on. Uh, you know, just kind of see what's, see what's up. So they should have passcodes on them, but parents should know what they are. Uh, sometimes you have to uh, use different passcodes for different kids because like with our younger, youngest, he likes to try to get on the phones and, and uh, cause problems and do things and look at stuff you shouldn't be looking at. So you just have to, we have to kind of keep up on that, make sure we know, um, you know, what the access is. So next one is no co-ed texting or communication. Uh, we do allow email back and forth, co-ed, but it has to be appropriate. Um, but we just found, uh, at first we didn't have this rule, but we found that it was just too much, uh, too much responsibility for them. So, um, so no co-ed stuff, uh, without, there is some exceptions to the app, like, like for example, if they're working on schoolwork where they were working in a team with, uh, co-ed, then, then there's unique circumstances where they can come and talk to us and we'll, we'll authorize some communication in that regard. Uh, next one is no social media without approval. So there is certain things that we'll allow them to do and allow them to look at, but it needs to be with permission. And obviously with all these rules, they're gonna change over time as they age. And that's the big thing is it's not a one and done. This is a relationship. We're trying to build smart, uh, integrous, you know, young adults and, and people. And, and that, that takes a relationship. They need to learn from us and watch us and see what we're doing. And so all these are gonna change and evolve over time. This is, this is just an example of related to where we're at at this point. No games. We don't allow games on the phones or computers. We just found that games are too much of a problem, uh, especially for the boys. We just live in such a busy world and there's so many different things to do and so many different things to learn. You know, they, they struggle with keeping up with a lot of the different things that they, they, we want them to do with foreign language and, and music and different things that we just don't, we've, we've gone in and out with games in the past and we just don't feel like there's time for them. There's just so many different options and things to do in life that, you know, games, I just cannot see in the future how somebody's gonna look back on that and say, oh my gosh, I really missed out on something because I couldn't play video games on my phone. Like, it's just not gonna happen. So it, to me, it's just a waste of time. 
Uh, in our family, there's no new apps without daddy review. That could be daddy or mommy. Uh, just they, they cannot download new apps without reviewing them with us. Just is not going to happen, and it shouldn't happen. Uh, they have to fo follow good phone etiquette. So look up some phone etiquette. I mean, there's just some, some, some things that are uh, important and just from, a, from the standpoint of helping them learn how to communicate well, I think that's, that's just a really good thing. Uh, we use iPhones, but most of the phones have some kind of tracking mechanisms and sometimes there's multiple ways of doing that. So that has to be turned on and shared with the parents uh, at all times. It can't be turned off. Respond promptly to family communication, whether it's text or email or phone or whatever. That's got to be a priority. That's the real purpose of the phone at its core for a family is to be able to communicate. And it's really important that everybody agrees to respond quickly. Uh, no excessive texting. So we know that kids like to communicate back and forth and a lot of stuff goes back and forth and different things, but sometimes the communication just becomes stupid and there's like 200 texts back and forth and they haven't said anything and I've, I'm annoyed like sifting through those like this is just a waste of time. So we limit them to about five. We say, look, go five back and forth. If it's still stupid, then just stop. You know, wait till the next day and start some more stupid. But don't waste your time texting back and forth like that. Uh, let's see, phones on the chargers, which in our house is in our living room, and we have uh, a station for charging. They have to be on there by 10 p.m. Uh, if for some weird reason we happen to still be up later, they can look at them, but they need to stay plugged in and just stay right there. Uh, a lot of times the kids, our kids put them on there earlier. Uh, you know, they're just done, you know, and, and a lot of times we're going to bed before that anyway, so... Uh, no phones in the morning until homework and uh, any kind of housework or house maintenance or different stuff is done. We do allow them to look at the phones briefly, but they have to remain plugged in. So it's kind of, they have to like stand there if there's something real quick they want to look at or something that's, we do let them do that. But it's not of this like, okay, let's get on the phone and start with that for an hour or something before they get their homework and, you know, all their other stuff done. So... Uh, and it's, it may be very different for us because we homeschool and so our kids are home. They're usually doing homework most of the morning and housework and stuff. And usually that routine is fairly well done by midday or something. And then, you know, there's errands and, and you know, different things that, that might be going on. So it's a little bit different in our house maybe. Uh, let's see. One of the latest ones that we've added is no uh, taking or texting of photos of the opposite gender. So we have boys and girls and our kids. And so uh, the situation that kind of came up for us was, was our son was taking pictures of our daughter, innocent pictures, they weren't, you know, bad or anything, but he was texting them to a mutual friend who was a boy who happens to like our daughter. And I just felt like that was inappropriate and it was a path that I wanted to cut off immediately before it, you know, kind of led to something that could be inappropriate. So uh, no taking pictures of your sister or brother, friend or whatever of the opposite sex and then sharing those with other people. Even with the same uh, gender, it may not be appropriate, but that's something they'll need to learn for, for right now. We just, we just say, look, none of that with the opposite sex. So anyway, that's our phone list. Hopefully this is helpful. I'll post more information down below and uh, feel free to post comments and, and, uh, and whatever. Hopefully there isn't a bunch of bashing that goes on because my whole point for posting this was just to try to be helpful for other parents like us who are searching for answers. So there you have it.